As we sing and we declare that you are a good God. God, you are so good. And Father, we can say that it's because you are an unchangeable God. God, you are the same in the days of Abraham when you provided for him, when you gave him a child that is from you. Father, you are just as good when you told Jeremiah that there is a plan that is to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. Father, we thank you that you are that God as well, that save your people, that cause to have a group of people that continues to follow you and worship you. Father, you are also that God that is unchangeable. When you called Paul to write down this word, he who began a good work in you, in me, will bring it to completion. So, Father, you're a good God. You're an unchangeable God. And on your promise, we can hang on to. And, Father, as a church here, we continue to look to you as our focus. We continue to look to you as our all. We continue to have a hunger and thirst to want to find you and to seek you, to know you. For, Father, without you, Father, it is the stark reality is that we are running in circles without a way out. Father, in the past week, if we had been trying to live our own lives without you in it, Father, we ask you to forgive us. Father, if in the past week we have been relying on our own wisdom to do things and to solve problems and to rely on our own strength and ability, Father, we ask you to forgive us. For Father, open our eyes today to see that without you, Father, we can achieve nothing good. And help us today to continue to worship you, to continue to look to you, to continue to know that you're a good, good Father who will provide for us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And we acknowledge that all good things come from God. And as a response to Him, we want to give Him of our tithes and offering. It is an action that shows that we want to be part of God's kingdom. And as we give to him, we know that he, this is what he has already provided for us. So as church, as brothers and sisters, let us give with a cheerful heart. Let us know that it is him who has given us all. Let us do this with gladness in our heart.
Father God, may we worship you. We worship you with all our hearts. Father, we bow before you and we want our lives to bring you honor and glory for you are our maker. You mold us and you shape us and that through our lives we want to bear witness of how you've changed us. Father, we offer up our lives, we offer up our wealth. Father, we offer up our talents, we offer up our lives. May you use it. May you direct us. May you cause your fame to be spread throughout the earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. You are so welcome to Chinese Gospel Church of Dublin. It is great to see uh, those returning from holidays. And I know some of you are new for the first time in our church. If you are new, would you put up your hand so that we... If it's the first time that you are attending church, if you put up your hand. You are so welcome. I, I look forward to getting to know you. And welcome... Uh, I want to take a few notices now. Please stay for tea and coffee later on uh, to al allow us to fellowship with one another. Uh, the tea will be served in a sports hall. The next item. If you're not in any care group, I strongly encourage you to be part of a care group because this is where we uh, go deeper into the Word of God to understand what it is and it's also a group where you can pray for one another and help us help each other to grow through uh, uh, our Christian walk. So uh, if you are not in a care group, and you can ask me, and I'll tell you, uh, I will provide you suggestions for where you can go. The next item. Please remember that on the 24th of September, which is a Monday evening, from 6.30 to 9, there is a family celebration of the Mid-Autumn Festival uh, in the hall here. Uh, if you know Chinese, there, there's lots of uh, games and uh, musical, uh, uh, musical presentations, and there's food as well. And if you're English speaking, uh, next slide, we have an event in the Stable B, which is uh, the hall directly opposite to uh, the auditorium here, and where we'll be telling stories uh, uh, giving uh, each other an opportunity to understand our faith in God. So from sev uh, 7 to 8 is grateful, and then from 6.30 to 9 uh, is the Mid-Autumn Festival. Uh, there'll be opportunity for children to uh, have a lantern as well uh, to celebrate this family occasion. Next item. Without, uh, I'm going to pass the time over now to Pastor Chow for God's word to us. And may God speak powerfully through him. Good morning. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 again, which is the motto verse that we have been looking at throughout this year. Let's remind ourselves of what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So last week, we meditated a little bit upon this notion of worship, true and proper worship. And we were reminded last week that what Paul says here about true and proper worship reflects ourselves offering our bodies as living sacrifices. In other words, what we are being reminded of here 
once again today is that worship is not a special event, not how Paul described it, not how the Scripture encouraged us to think. Worship is not just a special event. Worship is not just Sunday morning. Worship is not just when we sing songs. Worship is presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. Paul says this is the true and proper worship. So coming, coming to God, coming before God, giving ourselves to God, offering ourselves, and, and we, we were reminded last week of this notion of sacrifice, making a sacrifice. It's not, it's not the notion that you are losing something. When you make a sacrifice, you are making an offering, you are making a gift to God. And this is a gift that is not an external thing that you can send to God and you are far away. This is you giving yourself. You are the gift. So when you are giving yourself as a gift to God, God is receiving you. And that is your encounter with God. So worship is not an event. Worship is an encounter with God. 24 hours, 7 days a week, if you are able to offer your life, you are able to consistently and continuously worshiping God. Of course, we have events. We have Sunday mornings. We have praise and worship meetings. Those events are not doing something different. Those events are doing something deeper, something that you are doing. Or in other words, if you are not a worshiping person, if you are not encountering God in your lives all the time, coming to a worship meeting, you find it very difficult to enter into worship. And we're reminded, we were reminded last week of what happened when you encounter God. And we took the example of Isaiah. When Isaiah encountered God in Isaiah chapter 6, we're reminded that four things happened to him. The first, and that reflected when we worship, when we encounter God, the first thing is to see God as who, re, who He really is. To see the magnificence of God, to experience, to be exposed to the greatness of God. When was the last time you stand in awe of God? When was the last time that you stand before God and you, you, you felt the amazing reality, the amazing greatness, the beauty, the absolute fantastic presence of God? When you worship, that is the first thing. And when you come into this amazing presence of God, the second thing that will happen to you is that you begin to see who you really are. You begin to see your inadequacy. You begin to see your sinfulness, your lack of holiness. And that is why you saw Isaiah, when he encountered God, his response was, woe to me. That's why you saw the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter, when he first encountered God, uh, encountered Jesus, on the fishing boat, his response was, whoa, I'm a sinner, away from me. When we see how great God is and we see how problematic we are, the wonder of worshipping God is that we do not feel condemned. Because the next things that you experience when you see the greatness of God, God's greatness includes His love and His mercy and His compassion. So when we see the greatness of God, we experience the greatness of God, and we begin to be aware of how inadequate we are, your experience is to experience the mercy and the grace and the love of God. And Isaiah experienced that. When the burning cold from the altar of God touches his lip, he was forgiven. He was cleansed. And when you experience your grace, the grace and the mercy of God, you begin to be set free to to want to, to step into the kind of person that God wants you to become. So when you encounter God, you change. You change inside. You change inside completely. You change your heart. You change your mind. You change your soul. You change your strength. So worshiping God is, is, is therefore not about what God can do for us. And coming to church, coming to worship on a Sunday, you reflect the same thing. Coming to church to worship is not about how we can feel. Of course, God created us to have all sorts of 
feelings, all sorts of influence. Like if you have good light, mood lightings, you have beautiful songs, you have good company, and you feel good. But those feelings are not worship because worship is not about you. It's not about your feeling. It's not about how encouraged you are or how touched you are. Worship is about what we are bringing to God. That's why worship is about worshiping God. It's not about, in exchange, getting something back. So how do we encounter God? How do we enter into Now, we understand what this worship is. How do we ent enter into worship? And we look at the example today from the book of Luke, chapter, nine, 19, chapter 19, and we look at the story of the person Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is a story that we probably all very familiar with, but let us remind ourselves of that story. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. And since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. He had gone to the guests, he had gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possession to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house. Because this man, he too is the son of Abraham. And for the son of man, come to seek and save the lost. So let's just bow our head in prayer. And as we take this passage apart, let us see what God has to say to us today. Let us pray. Let us pray that Lord will take away all the obstacles in our lives, all our feelings, all our moods and take away all the struggles and all the distractions that are in our lives at this moment in time. Holy Spirit, come and help us to, to focus upon you. Help us to be drawn close to you, to hear you, to hear your still, small voice speaking to each one of us. Father, for we desire your living word in our lives to change us. Father, we acknowledge that as we come before you, you are so great and we are so little, that we are so lacking in your glory in our lives. But Father, we ask for your grace, we ask for your mercy, and we ask that now your Spirit may come and touch us and guide us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, Zacchaeus, we all know, is a tax collector. And he was not just a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector of all of Jericho. And we here read that he was a very wealthy man. And he became wealthy by collecting taxes. Now, he was a Jew, so he was part of the people that he collected the taxes from. So, from the perspective of the people of Israel, from the Jewish people, he was a traitor. He went over to the other side, to the Roman side, to collect taxes from them, to pressure them, and to cheat them out of their money, out of their income. Now, if we understand the word Zacchaeus, the name, the name, the word actually means the righteous one. So he was named, his name was righteous. And yet, there's a, begin, there's a bit of an irony just to see that his name was righteous, but he was doing something, his life was not reflecting his name. Now, according to the Bible, according to the story here, we see Zacchaeus was a short man. And it also seems that at this particular moment, he was not just short in statute. He was not just short physically. He was short in many ways. He was short morally. He was short socially. He was an outcast by his own people. He was short morally. He was doing things that probably not the right things to do with his life. Now, that's, that's something that we want to anchor our thoughts on at this moment in time. Here is a man who is short, who has fallen short, 
like what the Apostle Paul says in Romans, fallen short of the glory of God. His life wasn't glorious. His life was fallen short of the glory of God. And yet we see here that he desired, he wanted to see Jesus. The first encouragement from here is that if we want to worship God, if we want to encounter God, we need to realize that we are not perfect. We need to realize that we are short. We are short of the glory of God. We cannot have pride. We cannot say, now how do you, how do you, how do you know that you have pride? I know because that is probably one area that I struggle most with. You have pride when you think that you know better than other people. You have pride when you think that you can do things better than other people. You have pride when you don't want to listen to other people. Or when people want to say things to you, you get upset. You have pride when you think that no one else can help you. Zacchaeus was short. And this description, I want to expand our thinking. He was not just physically short. He was short in his intellect because he didn't even realize who Jesus was. He just thought that Jesus was a nice man to meet, a famous man that he wanted to see. He was short morally because he was doing things sinfully in his life. He was short socially because he was an outcast. Yet his name was righteous. So the first lesson that we learn from this morning, from this passage, is that to encounter God, to experience God, it really doesn't matter what your status is or where you are. It doesn't matter that you are spiritually lacking. It doesn't matter that you're emotionally lacking. There is no condition that says you're not ready to come before God. A lot of us say that we, you know, we don't feel like worshipping. Not feeling like worshipping should not be an obstacle. Not feeling like worshipping and therefore stopping you from worshipping God stopping you from coming before God. That is the biggest lie that Satan can throw towards us. So you don't feel like it, so don't. You don't feel like going to worship God, so don't go. You don't feel like coming to church, don't come to church. You don't feel like reading the Bible, don't read the Bible. You don't feel like that is, that is a lie because God says, you don't feel like you can still come. You should still come. In fact, it is when you feel short, when you feel inadequate, that is the time when God says you should come before Him. So for those of us today who are feeling a little bit short, we are feeling a little bit lacking, we are feeling a little bit inadequate, we are feeling a little bit not right, feeling a little bit moody even, that is the time when God says, now come and encounter me. Because that is the time when we need God the most. So for Zacchaeus, that was indeed an awakening moment. When Jesus was about to pass his way, he had a desire. Is Jesus coming your way now? Well, Jesus is here. Jesus is not coming. Jesus is here. This is his house. We have entered into his house. So the second lesson, the first lesson is nothing can stop us from coming to Jesus. Nothing can stop us from coming to encounter God, and nothing can stop us from coming to worship. So now, are we going to find Jesus? No, Jesus is already here. But so what are we willing to do today? What are we willing to do at this moment in order to engage, in order to have that encounter, in order to enter into that worship? You know, we saw in this story that Zacchaeus ran and climbed a tree. Well, that actually is a very encouraging thought. Zacchaeus was a grown man. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. Zacchaeus was a high government official. He was the chief tax collector. He was the head of the revenue commissioners. He was head of the tax department. He was a well-known government official, an old person, a senior person, an adult. And yet, you, see, you, don't, you don't see people like that running. You don't see people like that climbing trees. Yes, Zacchaeus didn't, didn't consider any of that. He was willing to let people think how foolish he was, just like the story of, 
of, of, of King David, willing to dance, willing to dance before his, his people, his, 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 his citizens, willing to look foolish. What are you willing to do to come before God? Sometimes we, we come here to worship and we are so self-conscious of ourselves. We're so self-conscious of whether we should raise our hands whether we should even move our body, whether we should pop up and down, whether we should even dance. You ever thought of that? Oh, not proper to dance in the church. Was it proper for Zacchaeus to run? Was it proper for Zacchaeus to climb a tree? What are we willing to do to let go of ourselves? Lesson one that we shared, nothing is there to stop us from coming to worship God to encounter him. Lesson number two, the question is already Jesus is here, so what are we willing to do? What are we willing to cast aside? Don't mind who's sitting next to you. Don't mind who's standing next to you. You say, oh, I, I can't sing out loud. I don't sing very well. Well, we are here not for you, not for other people. You're here for God. God thinks your voice is beautiful. God gave you your voice. God gave you your sound. Never mind about the next person. And the next person, you shouldn't be laughing at the person next to you. You shouldn't be paying, the per paying attention to the person next to you. So he sang out of tune. So she sang out of tune. So he or she is encountering God. What about you? So we are willing to do whatever we need to do to come before God. And the third lesson is what? The problem with Zacchaeus was that he couldn't reach. He couldn't see Jesus. He was short. And that means that all the other people around him were tall. All the other people around him was preventing him from coming to encounter God. You ever felt like that? I'm not, entering, I'm not encountering God today, it's because of somebody else. Because he upset me. Because she upset me. Because today it was this worship leader that I don't like. I do like you, but... Or that preacher whom I have some issues with. Or that elder that I do not respect. It is not about the obstacles. There should be no obstacles. We can't become angry. Zacchaeus could have become very angry. He says, I'm a government official. I may be short. Get out of my way. Why are you blocking me? I want to see that fella. There's no point blaming obstacles, there's no point blaming other people. If we desire to come and encounter God, God is there for us to encounter. That is the fourth lesson. The third lesson is that don't blame the obstacles. Don't blame the things that are in your way. It's not their fault. It's you. It's all to do with you. And going back to the first point, it's not about your mood either. God is there, so it's completely open. Because if you want to encounter God today, if you want to encounter God in your life, if there's a will, there is a way. If you are sincere to have a desire to see Jesus, you will, you will see him. You will break through. The only question is whether you want to or not whether you feel that you need to or not. And the more, the smaller you feel, the shorter you feel, the more you should realize that, yes, I need God. And the encouragement thing when you read this passage, you read this story, is to see that Jesus knows we're looking for him. God today, here, knows that you are needing him in your life. That you desire to draw close to him. Because the story goes that when Jesus came to the tree, the sycamore fig tree that Zacchaeus was, Zacchaeus didn't have to shout and say, Jesus, Jesus, here I am, look at me. The passage says that Jesus, when he arrived at that point, he looked up. He saw him. He knew he was there. God knows you. God created you. God knitted you together in your mother's womb. God has a plan for you. 
God has a plan for all of us. And sometimes we deviate from that plan, we go our own way, and we get lost. When we feel far from God, who moved? God did not move, we moved. God knows us, God is expecting us, and God intend to come and bless us, to let us encounter Him. And God is calling and inviting you. Look at the story, because it's not just, Hi, Zacchaeus, here I am, you want to see me? There we go, here's my signature, autograph, bye, let's move on. No, Jesus says, come down. I want to, I want to interrupt my journey. Isn't that amazing? If you're Zacchaeus, isn't that amazing? So I just want to see Jesus. Jesus saw me, he called me, and he interrupted his whole journey. He didn't want to go on anymore. He says, come down. I want to take a break. I want to come to your house. I want to have a meal with you. See, God's desire for us to encounter him is a desire for intimacy with us. God's desire is not just, hi, bye, how are you? Fine, let's move on. God says, I want to be in your life. I want to touch you. I want to change you. I want to make your life better. I want you to become I want you to return to the person that I have intended you to be. So this is, this is really a classic picture that is also reflected in Revelation chapter 3. When we read in Revelation chapter 3 that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and stay with me. You know, for many, many, many years, when I first became a Christian, I quoted that passage when I go out and, and spread the gospel the, the, to try to talk to other people about Jesus. And I use that verse and say, look, Jesus is knocking at your door. Open your heart's door. But then I realized eventually that this, this passage, the passage in Revelations was in a letter written to the churches. It was in a letter written to Christians. It was more than just saying, hey, non-Christians, God wants to come into your heart. It's written to Christians. God is saying, I don't just want to to say hello to you, far, far away. And that is how a lot of us are when we come to church, when we come to worship God. God, far, far away. Let's come and you know, touch a little bit, feel a little bit, have some mood. But that's not worship. That's not encountering God. God's desire is to come into our lives. It's to, for, it's, 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 it's to touch our lives deeply is to have our lives changed inside and out. Jesus is calling. Jesus is inviting. And we need to respond. And we see Zacchaeus responding. We see Zacchaeus coming down quickly and gladly. He responded quickly. He responded gladly. Are you responding quickly and gladly today? Is the Spirit calling you now, touching your hearts now? And say, hey, open, open your house to God, open your hearts to God, open your lives to God. Whether you're Christian today or whether you are already a believer for many, many years. God says, come and worship, meaning come and encounter. Come and encounter God. Come and let Him touch your life. Come and let Him reveal Himself to you and reveal your true self to yourself. Come and experience His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. It's between you, between us, between me and God. Not about everybody else. It is about me able to enter into God's presence and be changed by Him and to return to the person that God intends me to become. That is what you see in Zacchaeus. Everything changed. Everything changed. Remember we talk about that verse. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And we saw last week when we meditated upon Psalm 100, that Psalm 100 talks about worshipping God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And here today, again, you see Zacchaeus. When he responded to encountering with God, as he encountered God, he changed. Change in his heart, change in his soul, change in his mind, change in his strength. His heart was changed because he repented and he was glad. You cannot 
truly repent and be glad if your heart hasn't changed. Zacchaeus' heart was changed. His soul was changed. He received salvation. He became righteous. God entered his house and entered his life. And as a result of that, his mind, his mind was changed. He no longer de de determined to do bad things. He determined to do good things. And he even offered to repay back the people that he had hurt more than the statutory requirement. He wouldn't have done that unless his heart has changed and his mind has changed. His heart has changed, his soul has changed, his mind has changed. His strength was renewed. He came down, he acted with passion. He hosted Jesus in his house. He was ready to testify. He was ready to put his life in order. He acted. It wasn't just, oh yeah, right, I understand now, and you go and doesn't change, doesn't take action to change your life. The call for God today is for us to understand that He's here. To, 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 to realize that He is here in our heart, in our spirit. And to be willing to encounter Him and let Him come into our lives and touch us. That is what worship is about. How are we responding today? You know, I want to end my sharing this morning with the story of Nathaniel. The story of Nathaniel, you can find that in John Gospel chapter 1. The calling of Nathaniel as his disciple. You know, John Gospel chapter 1 verse 43 says that the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee and finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. The Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophet who wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. He said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Before Philip called you, I saw you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God and you are the king of Israel. And Jesus says, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You should see greater things than that. He then added, I will tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's a very short story here to end. Very interesting story. But there's a depth of encouragement here. Because I believe that a lot of us today sitting here, after hearing the sharing, after hearing the sermon about worship, about encountering God, about God touching your life and changing your life inside out, after you hearing that story, a lot of us kind of say, well, is that true? Well, not convinced. Well, this is how Nathaniel feel. This is how he felt. You know, when, 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 when Philip found him and, and, and told him, look, we found the Messiah. We found the one Moses talked about. He's from, he's from Nazareth. Nathaniel's first response was, Doubtful. Can anything good come from there? Are you joking me? Are you kidding? A Messiah coming from, from that place, Nazareth? Today, maybe we feel the same thing. Pastor Chow, are you kidding? Are you joking? We can encounter God like that. We can be touched inside and out. We can enter into so free worship in our lives. Can it be real? Well, you know, we learn from Nathaniel. Even though he was doubtful. And Philip was the trigger. Philip, what did Philip say? Don't doubt in your head. Don't just sit there and doubt. Don't just sit there and question. Come and see. Come and see. God is saying the same thing to us today. You want to encounter me, God says? You want me to touch your life inside? You want to set free to worship? 
You want to set free to have your life so close to God and God dining with you. And heart, mind, and soul all revived. You want that? Come. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. And when Nathaniel did go and see, he did encounter. And he did encounter the true Jesus. And Jesus says, you shall do greater things. You shall see greater things. And you shall see the true glory of heaven. And I believe that Nathaniel did enter into that level of encountering with God. So today, let us be encouraged. For a couple of weeks now, we have been encouraged to encounter God, to encounter God in worship. Are you willing to? There's nothing to stop us. Nothing for us to say, I'm not good enough. Zacchaeus was not good enough. Nothing for us to say, I don't understand, I don't know, Zacchaeus didn't understand, Zacchaeus didn't understand, didn't know. There is nothing, there is nothing that is in the way. And we don't blame, we can't blame anything. We can't blame other people, we can't blame the person next to you, we can't blame the person around you, we can't blame the worship leader, we can't blame the worship team, we can't blame the preacher. Today, that's what we're saying. You can't blame anything. Can't blame the light. Can't blame the heat. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too bright. It's too dark. The music is too loud. The drum player is too handsome. Too distraction. Or the worship leader is too beautiful. Or whatever. It's about you. It's about what God is saying to you today. Come and see. Come. An experience. Jesus is saying to you, I saw you. I know you. Come down. And I come into your house and dine with you. Are you willing to do that? To take that step? Let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. And as music starts, as, as we sing, as we hear the music, let us open our hearts and our mind to God. And in this final closing moment, step into encountering Him. Step into letting Him touch our life.
Amen. Father, thank you for your message to us this morning, for your encouragement to us this morning. That there is nothing that prevents us from encountering you, nothing that prevents us from being drawn close to you, because you are the one who have invited us. You are the one who is waiting for us. And the condition for coming to you is not dependent on how good we are, how successful we are. In fact, you have said to us that the more humble we are, the more we realize we are in need, the more we should come before you. So, Father, teach us and encourage us. Help us to cast aside all our prejudices. Help us to cast aside all our struggles. Help us to cast aside all our attitudes. Father, that as we go from this place into the life that you have for us, help us by your Spirit to be able to encounter you. For today, you say to us, those who are willing to open up the door, you will come in and dine with us and stay with us. Today, we open up our hearts to you. Right now, we open up our hearts to you. Come in. And dine with us, and stay with us, and remain with us, so that as we live our lives from this day on, we have your transformation in us, heart, mind, soul, and strength. We have your closeness within us, right there in the middle of our lives, in our hearts, in our soul, in our mind, in our body. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you into our lives. And so, as we leave here, we know that you will not leave us because you have come into our lives. You will not leave us, nor forsake us. May we, in this coming week, encounter you always, living with you always. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of our Father God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, is there, remaining with us, always. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you in the coming days. Amen.